Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see if I get this working right. Haha. -ha. I can be taught. I have no Diet Coke this morning. It's making me very sad. The machine downstairs did not want to give me any. So uh, I'm in a little withdrawal, but thankfully I did have a Red Bull first thing, so I should be good. Um, so this morning, I'm here to talk to you about optimization. I, I title this uh, Think Fast because my top, I, I'm a, a big advocate of making sure all of your web content is delivered and viewable on whatever device it's being viewed on as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm going to ask a quick question because I have kind of some stuff to lay a, a, a framework. Um, how many people have seen me talk about optimization before? I recognize one or two people in the room and almost nobody else. Okay. So I will use some of that framework then and, and not just blow through it too quickly. Um, so first off, who am I? Uh, senior web developer at D2L. Uh, I started doing web development about 20 years ago when I uh, somehow discovered the internet at university. Um, I've never willingly used the blink tag. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I've kind of dabbled in kiosks and, and multimedia development and web development and app design and I, I kind of have a smorgasbord of, of uh, things, uh, let's say a jack of all trades, master of absolutely none of them. So uh, that's where I get my perspective from. Um, I want to start by talking about how long a second is. Uh, this is pretty important um, as you'll quickly determine, see because of how people perceive the web these days. So in 2004, we're way past the 56K modems now. Uh, people were willing to wait about 8 to 10 seconds for their content to load. Uh, so, you know, that's a reasonable amount of time, thank goodness, because we had so many flash uh, preloaders and all that stuff at the time hogging all of our bandwidth. In 2006, uh, Akamai did another study that said it had dropped to 4 seconds. So two years, half the time people are willing to wait now for their content to load. In 2009, uh, Akamai and Ju Jupiter did another study that said that 40% of users will abandon a page if it takes longer than three seconds to load. Generously, people on mobile devices will actually give you five. And in 2012, uh, Microsoft Speed Specialist said that a quarter of a second is, competitive, is the definition of a competitive advantage on the internet these days. It's ridiculous to think that we're talking about milliseconds here, whether or not you're going to be able to sell to a customer or your competitor is. So what does that mean in terms of dollars and cents? That's you know the most important to all of us. Uh, in, uh, Amazon tried an experiment once where they increased the load time by 100 milliseconds, so one-tenth of a second, and they saw a 1% decrease in their sales. Now, they did this test in 2007, and if they'd left that run the whole year, they would have lost $148 million. In you know, 2007, I think they sell a little bit more today. That number would probably be a bit higher. Uh, Google, this is, uh, this is going way back. They tried giving us 30 results a page instead of 10 at one point in time. That resulted in a 20% drop in both their traffic and their ad revenue, which is just staggering. If they'd run that uh, entire campaign throughout 2006, they would have lost $2.1 billion. And if you put that into today's values, if, if Google tried increasing the, that load time by the same factor, at half a second, they would have lost $8.5 billion last year. So this is important. What can we do about it? Let's try starting with reducing network delays. We're always going to have problems with, with the speed of our networks. No matter what, we're confined by, well, at least the speed of light, because that's the fastest we can tra transfer data right now. Uh, but we have copper wires, we have fiber optics, we have radio waves, we've got servers and routers and everything in between. And all of those pieces of technology slow down our data. So what can we do about it? Uh, the average worldwide round trip time for Google, who have servers absolutely everywhere around the world is about 100 milliseconds. So even they have one-tenth of a second on every single connection, no matter what, to get the data, the, before they even start transferring the data to you. With mobile, 
that goes up to a full second, even for Google. And if your cellular radio was off, which it does turn itself off all the time to save the, the precious juice in your phone, you're adding one to two seconds just for it to start up. So every time you go to your web browser, your, your phone's taking a second or two just to get that radio up and running before it even hits the net to try and grab the data for you. So latency is limited by the speed of data. Uh, our best case is fiber. Our worst case is copper. Now we've got some things to think about. Uh, we can think about concurrent connections. So every web browser is capable of connecting to a server more than once at the same time. That's great. It means we can transfer a lot of files to the browser at the same time. But it's still not a high number. Uh, Internet Explorer, I hate praising Internet Explorer, but Internet Explorer has the most right now, eight concurrent connections. That means if you've got, let's just be conservative here, 24 assets linked into your page, whether that be JavaScript, style sheets, uh, images, uh, whatever, it can only load eight of those at a time. It's going to cycle through this process three times of connecting to a server, getting the data back, connecting to the server, getting the data back. And you've got the leg every single time it does that. So, and, and we have no way around this. The browsers are capable, though, of running multiple connections to multiple servers. So when you do that, you're talking about something like 50 or 60 concurrent connections. So if you have, take advantage of things like alternate domain names or uh, content delivery networks or whatever, we can start to speed up the process here. There is, a side, there is a side note on this though, and it's something called domain sharding. And it's something that people try and do to get around this limitation. Basically, they fake having more than one server. Uh, so, you know, www.yoursite, www2, whatever you want to call it, you're pointing all of those domains to the exact same server. On a desktop, you're not going to see any real difference. The web browser isn't going to make things faster for you, but it isn't going to make things slower. Most mobile devices, though, are going to have a problem with this technique. It's actually going to slow down your data. And there's been a lot of uh, research done on this. Uh, Mobify did some testing a while back. They did over 3 million samples of web pages to see how this was affecting things. And it was definitely having a, being a very detrimental effect on mobile performance. So if you're going to use multiple domain names in order to, to get increase that concurrent connection limit, make sure it is actually multiple servers as well, or it's not going to work. We can get on the topic of content delivery networks. Uh, if you're delivering basic code libraries like jQuery or MooTools or whatever, you can use Google CDN, uh, Microsoft House One Two, um, Cloudflare. There, it uh, there's has some of the more um, on the fringes libraries. So if you're playing with those, that's a good source to check out. The reason for using these is twofold. One. Their, their uh, servers are going to be closer to the user's connection point than you are. That's going to speed up delivery of the data. But also, everybody else, if they, everybody else uses them, and right now it's estimated somewhere over 50% of jQuery lo install, uh, loads are coming off of Google CDN, it's already in the browser's cache. That browser doesn't even have to make a connection to the server because it's already uh, accessible. Combine your images in your code. Every connection that we can reduce will speed up your page, page delivery. So sprite sheets, uh, combining your JavaScript, CSS, all of that, it, it, that's a pretty basic concept. So image compression. This is going to get a little technical. Um, not too technical, because I don't understand all the math behind it. but. Uh, Image compression is a pretty important part of the process. Whether you're doing it as a developer or as the designer, and I, I push this stuff to my designers all the time because they can feed the stuff to me, you know, web developers. I'm lazy. A lot of web developers are. If the designers can do the work, all the better. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lot of tools and a lot of way of looking at things, but also uh, at uh, 
and some of the pitfalls you're going to run into. This is going to be one of the weirdest ones we're going to run into here. JPEG compresses data in 8x8 eight eight pixel grids. So what? Well, if you take a look at this image here, we have these squares lined up in 8x8, eight eight, lined up or not, sorry, in 8x8 eight eight grids. The blue lines are the grid lines. Um, we have moved one of those blocks off of that 8x8 eight eight grid and look at all the pixelation artifacts there simply because it didn't line up. That actually adds data to your file, and it looks horrible. So if you can, and this is being persnickety, I know, but if you can, line up your straight edges along the 8x8 eight eight pixel grid. You're going to make them look better. You're going to make them deliver faster. Red sucks. Uh, if you look at that scale there, we're talking about how many uh, uh, nanometers colors are in the visible spectrum. Red takes up a huge chunk of that visible spectrum. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you're saving a pic um, predominantly red image, you'll find that the compression isn't as good. It's because there's more data to pack into that image. You're going to have to ramp up your compression settings to get it down to a comparable size, and then it's going to get a lot of artifacts in it. So keep it in mind as you're developing interfaces, as you're adding elements, even just as you're figuring out how to treat the batches of files that you're compressing in JPEG format, you want to try and avoid red if possible. And if you are using red, set it aside and compress it separately. You'll get better results if you can separate the two. Like blues compress phenomenally, but reds are going to be a problem. So you may, and you probably don't want them to look like garbage, so you'll probably compress them a little less so they look better. It's a trade-off. Grayscale images. Um, grayscale compression in JPEG is very poor. There's a very technical reason for this. So uh, when you save something in JPEG, it converts it from RGB into what's, uh, what's called luminance and chroma. So luminance is how bright an image is. Our eyes really notice that factor more than anything else. So when you save something in JPEG format, it ramps up that luminance and keeps it as high as possible. It doesn't compress it as much, but it does compress the colors more. Well, a grayscale image doesn't have color. All it has to play with is the luminance. So you're going to find when you're trying to compress grayscale, you're not going to get as much compression out of it. It's still going to be better than GIF or PNG or whatever else if it's a photographic image. Uh, but here I've saved these two JPEGs in exactly the same settings, 87% out of Photoshop, progressive. Uh, the color got down to 65 and a half. The grayscale only got to 48 and a half, and there's no color value in that. Like you would think with one channel, that should be a third of the size, and it's nowhere near. Uh, if you're saving things out, um, you're mostly going to do this for archival purposes because you're trying to save your file sizes a little bit. If you're trying to say, OK, I'm saving this JPEG as 100% so that it's high quality for later, uh, and hey, it looks smaller than the somebody originally provided it to, to me, no, it's still throwing away data. 100% compression in a JPEG exporter doesn't mean that it's saving pixel perfect data from the original. It's still compressing it. Uh, it's just the way the mathematical formula works for compression. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're trying to compare that percentage between Photoshop or Fireworks or whatever, uh, GIMP, whatever software you're using, keep in mind that those scales mean absolutely nothing when you're comparing them against each other because there is no standard. Everybody who creates a JPEG exporter uses a different scale. So 100, so 80% in one is going to be the equivalent to 50% in another. You're going to have to play with it as you div use new software to figure out where that compression is taking place. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of software will claim that it's getting even better compression than Photoshop, for example. Well, Adobe spent a bit of money making sure that that compression routine is pretty good. So yes, the file size might be smaller, but it's going to be worse. It's going to look like garbage because their, their percentages are different. So tools for JPEG compression. 
as good as Adobe is, I'm still going to tell you to use something else after you save for web from Adobe. Um, file Optimizer for Windows, uh, Image Optim for Mac OS X. Uh, these are lossless compression tools. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to strip away a whole bunch of extra data that companies like Adobe like to cram into a JPEG file, which helps with their media management and bridge software and everything else for archival purposes. You don't need any of that for the web. You need just the raw data. So run all your images through that before you put it online, and you're going to save between 15 and 25% of the data, just because it cuts out like the EXIF and, and the metadata and all the other stuff that's crammed into that file. Um, there are tools out there that are lossy. Uh, basically, it's going to compress your JPEG more. You're going to get more artifact. You're going to get everything and, and uh, more distortion in there. So you have to be careful which tools you do pick because of that. By the way, I unless I say otherwise, every tool I'm going to mention today is a free tool. Go ahead and use it, and you don't have to worry about cost or anything like that. PNG would be our second choice for image compression these days. Um, I don't have a lot to tell you about in regards to pitfalls and everything on this one because <laughs> PNG is pretty basic. It doesn't matter. The compression algorithms are all the same. I, um, there's no real hiccups or gotchas in all of this with a couple of minor exception, exceptions. Um, you have to be careful of which tools that you're using to do your extra compression. Again, you run PNGs that came out of Photoshop through a tool like uh, image optimizer or smush it on the web um, and uh, and you're going to save data because it's getting rid of all that extra garbage in the file. Um, something like tiny PNG is going to actually start throwing away color values from your palette. It usually takes a 24-bit uh, PNG file and turns it into an 8-bit and it sometimes you won't care and that's a great thing. Take advantage of it. But if you're worried about color accuracy, like logos or anything like that, don't avoid using a tool like TinyPNG because you're going to end up with distortion. It doesn't care about your color palette. It's doing an optimization that it thinks is going to work for the human eye. Um, yeah, so actually, and so just to touch on that, there are two flavors of PNG. There's PNG24, which is your 24-bit channel. If you save that out of Photoshop or Illustrator, uh, you get an 8-bit alpha. If you save the standard PNG, which is only 8 bits of color, you only get one channel of alpha. So that can be a problem if you want that nice blend into the background of your web page. This is where using tiny PNG could help you because when it compresses, it takes that 24-bit, converts it to 8 by throwing away all the extra colors, it keeps the full alpha channel. So if you don't care about the color accuracy, all of a sudden you can, you can take advantage of a really good alpha channel tool and the compression of your PNG file. Uh, GIFs. Um, is anybody using these other than for cat memes? Um, unless you're doing something incredibly small, like we're talking 20 by 20 pixels or smaller, GIFs are no longer useful to us uh, or animated because most browsers can't support animated PNGs yet. Um, GIF, basically the file format itself has too much overhead on larger images. Uh, PNG is going to be smaller. So I just say avoid GIF these days. Uh, and if you're using anything smaller than 20 by 20, it better be an icon, because if you're using single pixel GIFs, somebody in this room is going to hunt you down. Uh, SVG. Um, I assume everybody knows what SVGs are, Scalable Vector Graphics. This is taking your Illustrator files, exporting them. There's still mathematical calculations of curves and lines and everything else, which is much smaller than actual pixel by pixel calculations. Um, this is great for a tiny file footprint. And the good thing these days is almost every browser we care about supports it. So if you are willing to throw away Internet Explorer under, uh, under version 9, and please, everybody do it. <laughs> um, and if you don't care about Android 2, SVGs are a perfect fill. And there are polyfills. You can revert back to PNGs or something else instead if you really need to support those older browsers. 
But I would recommend that you that you use SVGs as much as possible these days. Actually, uh, this is going to be a bit of a side note here. Um, in our shop, we have almost exclusively changed from developing our web interfaces, icons, whatever, in Photoshop over to Illustrator. It makes sense for scalability in the future, for preparing for raster or for uh, retina displays, uh, for blowing things out to print size if we're going to do some kind of publication. Um, and we can export everything as an SVG, and that's just a huge file savings advantage. SVG can be easily inlined into your code, so you're reducing network connections. Uh, it can be scaled without any problem to any device. There's just so many advantages of it. So if you're not using SVGs yet, or if you've only just dabbled, I really recommend you try and go out and use these. Uh, there are no perfect lossless compression tools for it, though. SVG is pretty compact to begin with. It's hard to compress something that's already so compressed. You can use a tool like Compressor.io. It does throw away points on your path. So it's something to keep in mind. If you don't mind optimizing your paths and throwing away a bit of extra data to save a little bit of extra uh, time on your transfers, then go ahead and try it out. Branching off of SVG, we get into web fonts. And this is one thing that most web developers don't really think about. And to be honest, I forget about all the time too. And I keep having to force myself to come back to this. You can take a, a, a web font and load it in. They're going to be maybe 20, 30K. This one here uh, was, I think, 40K in size, but had well over 1,500 icons in it. I will take that file size for 1,500 icons I load once on a single connection. That's insane. And the web hosting gl hub glyphs, this is free on uh, Font Squirrel, I believe. Um, you can pack so much into it. And it just like a, it, it, these are mathematical equations of curves, just like an SVG. So these scale to any size. You can, you can use them wherever you need to. Every browser out there that we care about supports them. There's no reason not to use these things. Um, there is one limitation, and one limit, and you can creatively get around it. Um, it can only do a single color. So if you don't mind that icon being blue, perfect. If you want it to have a gradient, you could fudge it. You can use SVG, you know, ha apply some gradients to the text, stuff like that. It takes some extra effort, but still entirely possible and very compact in size. And here's the best thing. You can make your own fonts. So there is a website out there that I've started using, Icomoon, I-C-O-M-O-O-N dot I-O. It's a web app. They offer a whole boatload of icon fonts already there. And you can pick and choose which icons you want. And you can upload your own. So now all of a sudden, instead of just using the icons and stuff that somebody else has developed, I can take my company's branding my product icons, whatever I want. And I can upload the SVG files to this tool, and it'll give me back web font equivalents, all compact into one file. It gives me a TTF as part of that package. I can pass that on to my print designers, and they can use these icons now in all of our print publications. And they're fully scalable. They're, they're compact. This is, this is a, a great new tool that we can take advantage of. And most people aren't really thinking about it, because when you think about graphics, you don't think about fonts. I'm going to take a step backwards. Everything I've been talking about is how to compress things. <coughs> but as we mentioned earlier, our network connections are highly valuable too. So something to consider is using Base64 encoding. It, uh, this is uh, a tiny portion of what an image of, I think at this, this code was eight social media sprites <laughs> in one file. And it looks like garbage in your code. But this means I can embed my file right into my CSS or my HTML file and deliver it in one shot instead of making another connection to the server. I wouldn't do this with, a, with every image on my site. It adds file size. You base 64 encode something, you're going to get about 20% bigger file. But I'm willing to trade that off because the next network connection for that tiny icon that's 200K in size, even base 64 encoded, is going to cost me a whole lot more time 
for the data for the for the latency and the network traffic than embedding that tiny amount of data into my style sheet. Uh, I have actually seen uh, app developers will take like 500 icons, pack it into a single style sheet, preload it into the app, and they're like, well, you know, it's going to cost us 40 40k, but it's 500 connections we avoid later. That's an insane number of connections to have to do when you've only got six or eight connections at a time at most. So again, you've got a trade-off, but this is pretty good. Oh, and you can do this either as part of the image source, uh, source attribute, or you can do it for background CSS elements. Whichever you need, it works in both cases. I'm going to do a little bit of hocus pocus here. Um, a uh, very smart man neater, named uh, Peter Rinkow, I hope I said that right, uh, posted something about this back in early fall. He had uh, a case where he needed to take a gorgeous, large photographic image and embed it into a page, and it had to be fully transparent along, along its edges. And when he tried to save that out so that it looked good and was transparent as a PNG, he was getting file sizes of 900K and upwards, which is just insane. Nobody wants to transfer that amount of data. And that's because PNG sucks at compressing photographic image. So what he did was he took a JPEG of the image, like I have here of my beloved Diet Coke. Uh, it's got all the little droplets along the side, and that's the sort of thing that I need to be transparent onto the background. Uh, and I, I saved that out as a JPEG. It's nice and small. I take an alpha channel copy from that image, and I save that out as an 8-bit PNG. I don't need any more than 8 bits. It's grayscale image. It's, again, nice and tiny. We're talking now, instead of hundreds of kilobytes, we're talking tens of kilobytes for two files. The magic sauce is SVG. You combine it in, basically you say, OK, I need that PNG file to be a mask for the JPEG file. That's all the code you need. We're talking five lines, you could say, uh, ten lines. You can compress that down to one if you really want to. Uh, it's something you can cut and copy and paste and, and use anywhere on your site. It's easy to implement. And all of a sudden, we're taking the, that, that Diet Coke can. If I save that as a PNG 24 with the full alpha channel, I was at 121.9K, and I took it combined down to 28.5. That's a radical savings in size, and your graphic designers are going to love you for this trick. Because they always want to have such beautiful imagery, and this is a way for you to actually be able to deliver it for them. Uh, sprites. How many people are not using sprites in this room? Well, a couple. OK. Then this is the most important thing you will learn today. <laughs> a sprite sheet. Uh, has, sprite sheets have been around for ages. They've been around since uh, Super Mario Brothers on the Nintendo Entertainment System. They've been around since Pac-Man. It's basically a method that programmers use to compress or to deliver all of the graphic files to the system in one shot. They put everything on this giant canvas, every po position of Mario jumping on the, on the Koopa or whatever it was into one sheet. And basically they just kept Slide, they put like a frame around it, and they slid this image back and forth so that only a tiny little portion of it showed at a single time. Mathematically, this is great. You're, you're saving file size. You're easily able to program these masks in place. Um, it makes a lot of sense. But from an internet perspective, again, we're worried about all of these connections that we're making. So uh, as separate PNG24 files, uh, I've got 10 social media icons here. Each one has a rollover. That's 20 files, 20 connections, 34 and a half K to deliver these. I can use a tool online. It's called instantsprite.com. You take all of those images, you drop it into the web browser. It instantly spits back a style sheet, just like this. All of the icons stacked into one image. It spits back the CSS code that shows that gives you all the tiles for that style sheet. It does all the work for you. I can hand this to my designers and say, just use this tool and make my style sheets for me. 
and they can pile it all in, and then they just hand me back absolutely everything I need to use on my web page. I don't have to do any work. Yay. Um, and I'm down to one connection, so I can make use of all of my other connections for other things, and I'm down to 11.7K in file size. That's just huge. I, I, this, this makes me giddy. I can then take it, that image and I can put it in Smush It, which is going to do a better job at compressing than Photoshop did or that, that instant sprites system did. And now I just shaved off another 38K. I'm down to 7.3K in file size. This is insane, like 37 to 7. OK, thank you. What if we took those and we turned it into SVG? <laughs> I had all of those images in, photo, in Illustrator to begin with, not Photoshop, sorry. Uh, I saved them out as SVGs. Now, SVGs you can combine into a sprite sheet or not. It's not going to re really make a big difference in terms of your file size, but I saved them all out, and it was about 12K, which was comparable to that sprite sheet that Instant Sprites gave me in terms of file size. These are now fully scalable. I can do whatever I want with them at any size on my display. And then I can turn those into a font. <laughs> so now I have a WOFF file that is 4.9K in size. We started with 37K in size. These are now a single file. It's a web font. Uh, if I use Ico Moon, again, it's giving me back four variants of web fonts, so that'll work in every browser. It's giving me back the code to implement all of those giving me back the style sheets to correspond with all the elements in the font. It's doing all the work for me again. I don't have to, I don't have to do a thing. I just cut and paste and drop it into my thing. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go back for a second and just mention uh, Instant Sprites again. Uh, it's a web-based tool. You're not actually uploading anything to a server. It does it all using the Canvas and JavaScript. So everything is done client-side. And it's open source, and you can take the code off of GitHub, and you can put it on your own systems and implement it yourself, and nobody ever has to touch, touch it uh, to the web to do this stuff again. So it's a great thing to integrate into your, into your product systems. Another tool that is used quite often for sprite sheets, it doesn't do all of the stuff for you, but it is a desktop-based tool, is uh, something called Texture Packer. This is actually a tool that a lot of game developers have been using for a very long time. You take all of your assets. You say, point you point texture packer at a, at a folder, and it's going to take everything in there, and it's going to combine it all into a single, single fairly compressed style sheet. Fabulous. It's just not giving you the CSS code to correspond with it. You have to do that yourself. So Instant Sprites wins out in that case. So now we take a look at code. Um, first up is loading order. Always load your CSS first. Always load your JavaScript last. There's two basic reasons for this. When you're loading your CSS first, your browser is now aware of all the additional assets it's going to have to load in, and it can keep chugging away at it. Keeps going. It also means that your page is going to look like it should as fast as possible rather than raw HTML, which nobody wants to see. JavaScript gets processed as soon as the browser encounters it. If you put JavaScript in the head of your HTML file, your browser is going to stop doing what it's doing and process that JavaScript because it might be changing the DOM and it might need to rethink things before it goes any further. So load your JavaScript at the end of the page where it's going to stop loading all your other assets. Uh, sorry. So it won't stop loading all of your other assets. Um, if your JavaScript's in the header, it won't. your browser won't even go and connect to get that next style sheet or that next icon or s image or whatever it is. It really does put a break on everything. Now, you can't always get around this. Um, if you want accurate tracking with, say, Google Analytics, you got to put it in the head because you want to make sure that if you have a bounce, you catch it before the user finishes loading the page. Um, you know, There's certain examples of why you would use JavaScript in the header. Uh, but wherever possible. Stick it in the foot. Uh, stick it right before the, the close of your body tag. When we're talking raw data, a lot of people are still using XML. And I understand why. It's very human readable. A lot of our old legacy systems are still producing it. 
but it is data heavy. Heavier than JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. It is JavaScript code. JavaScript doesn't have to think about JSON. It just knows what to do with it. If you're loading in XML, not only do you have a heavier file, you also now have a file that you have to process using JavaScript, which is going to, again, slow down the processing of your page. We're not necessarily even talking about how much time it's taking to transfer the data. The browser is going to slow down, and you never want that to happen if you can avoid it. And some more JavaScript hangups. Again, we're talking about optimizing the front end now because in the end, it's, the speed doesn't matter to the user if it's on the front end or the back end or the connection in between. They just want things to be faster. So some things to consider. Uh, variables are always fasti faster to reference than object properties or array items. So if you're going to be referencing something constantly, make it a variable instead of digging down into objects and arrays. DOM operations are very slow and very expensive. So minimize how many of them, how many DOM manipulations you're doing. If you're putting together a massive list based on some data that you've imported, don't append each list item into the DOM as you go. Build it all into one simple variable and then import it once. You will drastically increase the speed at which you're going to be building your page. Searching the DOM is slow. So try not to do it too much. Uh, and the DOM is prone to change, so you don't necessarily want to reference the DOM all the time if you want to ensure that your data is static. Take that data and stick it in a variable. Reference that and then go back to the DOM later. Uh, change CSS classes and not the styling of an element. This is because quite often elements of those classes will be similar and you will save the removal of a style and the addition of a style. It's just, it's not always faster, but classes typically are going to work faster than style changes. Uh, I'm going to breeze through this because I'm starting to run out of time. I'm going to talk about psychology for a couple of minutes. Um, these are mental tricks for people. Uh, so progressive images, um, always turn on that progressive checkbox or that interlace checkbox when you're saving out your files. Reason being, a user who sees this first Hello Kitty riding a unicorn slowly load down the page will feel like your page is loading way too slow. They see that image slowly fade in, and because something's in front of their eyes, ooh, shiny, they feel like that page is fa faster. Even if that file is slightly larger, even if it takes a slightly longer amount of time to load, it's going to feel faster, and that's all that matters, perception. If they feel like it's faster, they're going to keep using it. Uh, PNGs, when you use that interlace, interlace checkbox, it typically is going to make your file size a little bit bigger. JPEGs, 50-50 shot. It might make it bigger, it might make it smaller. Usually, I tend to see it smaller, but it's not always the case. Avoid spinners. Oh my god. At all costs. Um, there was one app development company who released version one of their app and they were doing pretty good and they had a lot of good feedback and they said, you know what, we want to speed things up for the next route, next uh, iteration. So they released the next iteration which had this load time drop by something like 30%. But they put a spinner in there to let the user know that something was happening while things was loading because everybody was a little uncertain if things were happening in the, in the first version. And as soon as they put the spinner there, even though it was 30% faster, 50% more complaints that it was slow. <laughs> As soon as we see these, we shut off, whether it's the beach ball, whether it is a spinner, whether it is a progress bar. Our brains are trained to think that means we're waiting, even if it's not that long. As soon as you put it there, people are going to feel slow. So there's some alternatives. You could have transitions that distract the eye. That makes things feel fa faster. Why else do you think Google puts things like card flips into all of their interface elements? While things are loading in the background, that card flip is, take, is taking your eye on this little journey and you don't care anymore about the delay. <laughs> so take advantage of animation, whether it's zooming in, whether it's card flips, whether, I don't care, do a transporter effect onto the screen, I don't care. But if anything that entertains the user is going to make them feel like it's faster. You can also frame content in. So you, if you put a block in where your image is going to be, even though your image hasn't, hasn't loaded yet, 
they see where it's going to be. They feel like something's happening. They feel like something's there. Makes them feel faster. Uh, progress bars. Uh, this is getting so technical. I would not have wanted to do this research, OK? Uh, they found out, somebody did this study, s people will feel, on average, that something is loading about 7% faster if you run your progress bar from the stripes from <laughs> right to left. <laughs> And, so, and I see so many go the other way. Apparently, that feels slower. Another note, now here I don't have this animated beyond just the, the, bar, the bar sliding here, but if you're actually growing your progress bar, do yourselves a favor and cheat. If you know that something is going to take up to seven seconds to load, then make your progress bar go up to run for 10 seconds and if you're done loading early and you jump that last 30 percent your users are going to feel like they just won the jackpot <laughs> so whatever you can do to make the user feel like they're winning that things are coming faster again take advantage of it on mobile devices touch states so on a mobile device when you're when you're tapping something quite often in the in that browser you don't see any reaction until your radio loads up and until the next page starts to load. That's very bad. Users want to feel like something actually happened. So take advantage of touch states. This is just like when you hover over something with a mouse, you see things change color. On mobile, we don't have that advantage. So you're going to need to add an active state into your CSS and create a listener for it. And basically what that's going to do is when you tap that button, it turns blue. And they're still waiting the exact same amount of time for the page to load. But it makes them feel like something has happened and it makes them confident that something's happening instead of just sitting there waiting and like tap again, tap again. And probably slowing it down because they keep hitting tap and they keep in start restarting that connection. Give them some feedback. Lazy image loading, you've probably seen this on a lot of websites these days where as you scroll down the page, the image loads in. And the reason for that is, well, now you don't have the advanced image load as the page is forming. You frame it out, you make sure that the page is blocked so that it remains fully accessible even though the image isn't there, so that the user sees a pattern in that page and feels like it's faster because something is already on, in, on the screen. Um, but use image, lazy image loading so that you can uh, save those concurrent connections until you actually need them and make sure the important stuff is loaded up front. Uh, okay, a few last quick thoughts here. Uh, I'm going to start with adaptive and responsive design patterns. Basically, don't overload mo mobile devices with crap. Um, make sure you're using either adaptive or responsive design. I don't care which, but cater the content to the, to the browser, to the device. Make sure that you're not s overloading it. Especially, again, we're talking mobile, you're talking about slower speeds, you're talking about less RAM. You need to conserve as much as you can. Uh, you can use a tool, uh, Worf, Worfle. <laughs> this used to be a, a server-side tool only, so basically your PHP code would reference this server. It would say, oh, you're this browser, so you have these uh, limitations and these features, and go ahead and deliver your content based on that. They now have a uh, client-side uh, JavaScript hook that you can use to do detection in the browser and figure out what the features are and again customize that page to make sure that it's delivered as optimally as possible to the device it's on. Uh, Server-side compression, make sure on your server you have uh, gzip enabled. Browsers are able to automatically talk with the server, server in, compressed, in compressed format so your code is going to automatically be gzip and that's just faster and it makes sense except that a lot of servers don't have this turned on by default. And it, it's once one checkbox, turn it on, take advantage of the speed. Uh, solo developers, oh, let's talk about really quickly because I'm out of time about putting this all together. Solo developers, if you're doing this on your desktop, there's a few tools you may want to consider. If you don't feel like playing around with servers of your own uh, on your desktop, Scout, it's a little app. You tell it to watch this fold. I use this for SAS, but it can do JavaScript and CSS minification all in one shot. Uh, file optimizer, 
doesn't just do images, it does JavaScript, it does CSS, it does everything, it'll minify it all and stick it in a nice neat package for you, again, free. Uh, Grunt, if you run a server on your machine, this is run on top of Node.js, it'll take care of auto automatically compressioning everything, it'll take care of automatically minifying, you just have to do some configuration, so you have to be comfortable with that. And if you're working in a team environment, then take a look at tools like Bamboo or Jenkins, which are basically going to take your code out of your Git repository or whatever you're using to store your code amongst your teammates, and then you can have it run tasks like minify all your images for you, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Minify your code for you, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. And then deploy it out to your servers, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, I had never touched any of these tools uh, 12 months ago, I figured out how to use Jenkins to manage uh, multiple instances of production, testing, publication, and development servers, minifying all the code, deploying it out to servers. I read one book. It's easy and quick to use, and it's all free. Uh, oh, I repeated a slide, and so that's it. Normally, I would ask for questions, but she even stood up. I'm so out of time. <laughs> So I'm going to say thank you, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, to fire me off a question on Twitter. I'll try and answer them as much as possible. I hope you got something out of this today, and thank you very much. <laughs>